pi. It is possible to calculate pi using only random numbers. Today I will show you how to create the C++ program that is estimating pi. I will explain the algorithm that is involved and also show the implementation. Afterwards we let it run and show the graphs for the results. Hi, my name is Zen and welcome to my channel. To understand how the algorithm itself works, we will have a look at the circle. So we will have two axes, the x-axis and the y-axis, and in there we will have a circle, or at least quarter of a circle. Now what we'll be doing is we will throw random numbers on the x and the y-axis at this circle. So for instance, we throw a random dart here at this point and have the x value of this point and the y value of this point. And now we can calculate whether this point here is inside of this circle or whether it is outside. The distance is calculated by x squared plus y squared and if the distance is smaller than 1, this means that this point here is inside of the circle. So if we repeat this for enough times, we can calculate how many times are in or how many of those points are inside of the circle and how many points of the uh, that we throw are outside of the circle. And then using uh, these numbers we can actually calculate pi. The first thing that we need to do is to create a class which is giving us the numbers and the calculation of the algorithm that we want to have. So we create a class which is called random pi and uh, give it a constructor. Do that one default because we don't really have any uh, any other reason not to and we will give it some data members. And the data members will be how many times we have called the algorithm and how many of those points were inside of the circle. So we will have basically the number of points or the number of samples, which is an integer. And we initialize this with zero. And then we have a second number, which is samples inside circle and this is the number of samples that finally landed inside of the circle. Now we need to, uh, also to access this so what we want to do is to calculate now the result given a certain number of samples and a certain number of samples inside the circle so we're going to create the method get result. This one will now return a float for us because pi is not an integer number. And the get result function will return the result. And the result itself and the result itself equals four times the number of samples that are inside divided by the total number of samples. So you already see that probably with one or two samples this estimation won't be really good but uh, if we get a sufficient amount of samples inside it should do a fairly well job. The next thing that we need to do is to add a function which allows us to add additional samples. So we create something that is called add sample and this function now needs to create two random numbers. So two random numbers for x and y. To do that there are usually good um, things already available so we are using the standard library to do that for us. So we will include the random header. So there is a header called random which includes all of this code. To add a sample we need two random numbers, one random number for x and one random number for y. So what we're going to do is we will create two local variables, x equals get random number 
and the same for y. Now we can calculate the distance that this, uh, this random point would have from the origin of our coordinate system. So we type in distance and this one equals um, x times x plus y times y times y. This is the distance that our point has from the origin. So usually we would need to calculate the square root of this distance, but because we just use this distance to check how far the point is away, um, it's not necessary because if it's smaller than one, then also the square root of it will be smaller than one. So what we do is we say if distance is smaller than one, it means that the point is inside the circle. And in this point, we need to increase the samples inside circle and for any calculation, we need to increase the samples outside of the circle or the total number of samples. So yeah, the next thing that we need to do is implement this function get random number. So we create a new function, which is called float get random number, and it should return us some random number. And how we're going to do it is like every good programmer does it. We will go to Stack Overflow and uh, basically copy paste the first result that we get for random numbers. So let's see how that goes. I already did that. And here is the first result that we get from Stack Overflow. However, uh, we need to do a few modifications for that because we want to create a little bit better or we want to make this algorithm suitable also for us because this is now just not exactly what we need. So the first thing is that we need to create this uh, distribution and uh, the dist a random distribution between a certain uh, in a certain range. So it's just an integer. So we want to have a random distribution that goes from 1 to 1000 just to have a little bit of leeway. And then also what we need to do is to move this as a member of our, um, of our class because we don't want to create this uh, random number generator every single time we call this number. We just need to get a new number afterwards. So because it's not the district six, we can delete that. So what we're going to do is we move these distributions and the generation of them to our class members. We already have our class members here, so we're going to move them here inside. And then we need to initialize them. And the best place to initialize them is the constructor of our class, which is currently the default constructor, but we will replace it now by something more useful which in our case is for RNG, we need to call this one or we need to initialize it with our value of our random device. Which basically means this one. And now we can also create our distribution. Now we can use this distribution to put it basically inside of our random number generator where we just say we want to return a float which we call result and result equals the call to distribution divided by 1000 dot zero. So this 1000 dot zero, we automatically cast this to double. And so we, we get a good calculation for that. Then let's also initialize our distribution up in our construct constructor. So we are put the distribution here. And 
initialize it with the right numbers and then we can remove it here because apparently it doesn't know the numbers here. So we have also the distribution and this distribution still needs the random number generator, not that one, the random number generator to work. So yes, it looks like we have finished our complete class. We can uh, get the random number, we can add the sample and we can get the result. So the random number itself should not be publicly available because this is more or less a hidden implementation detail. So we can additionally remove this to the private uh, functions of our class. So the public interface is just a constructor, add sample and get result. So let's now initialize the class that we have just created in our main and execute the main and see what happens. So what we're going to do is we will create an object of type random pi. And this was the name that we gave our class. So we call this one random pi. And then we can add some samples. So we're just going to create a simple for loop, which is iterating over, I don't know, let's try our number of samples that we want to have. So I is smaller than just 1000 samples. And then we increment that. And for random pi, we will just call the add sample functionality. And afterwards, what we will do is we will print the result of random pi get result. And now with 1000 samples, we can see what actually will happen. So usually I use here to output the values, I use ice cream. So if you don't know about ice cream, you should definitely check it out. Much easier to use than this uh, standard code stuff. So really use that one. But now we go to the console and compile our program. I have here created already some me some build files. So you can have a look at them in the GitHub. Um, but right now I don't really want to bother you with them. But what we're going to do is we will now build this program and we now need to compile it and then afterwards we can run it and see what exactly happens. So yeah, it did compile and now we start it and the result that we get back is something like 3.092. I guess it's a fairly good estimate of pi given that we have only thrown in 1000 samples. So I guess it's doing the job, right? But having this just run inside of our console is a little bit boring because we also want to see how the estimation progresses over the number of samples. So I have already prepared a little bit of a GUI which can then show us the graph of how this, how this actually works. So we can just activate this app here which is currently commented out. And now we can add our random pi calculation to this app itself. So we add this one as a private class member and then we can inside the update functionality. So the update functionality inside of GUI apps usually means that this one is in, in the vicinity of the frame rate, which means that each frame, the update function is exactly called once. So usually what you want to um, divide it between the calculations and the GUI, but because this is a really, really simple app, we can now just uh, put also all of the calculations inside of the update functionality without impacting it too much. So what we're going to do is that each update, we basically want to add a random sample to our random pie like we did here. And we're going to remove that from our main function. And now what we need to do is that we have here two vectors, it's sample and the samples and pi estimate. So we need to basically get uh, or basically append here to plot this, uh, the number of samples and the current estimate of pi. So to get the current estimate of pi, what we're gonna do is basically we're going to pi estimate um, dot pushback, which is appending the result uh, that we have here from the random pi 
to our current estimate. So we use here get result and the pend is to our vector. And for our samples, we need to append how often we have done this. So we're gonna also push back. And what we need here is basically the current sample. And current sample we currently don't have. So probably we need to add this to our random pi method where we can just uh, read out the samples. So something like um, get samples. And what we just return here is the samples value. And then we can also use this in the main function. And here we can call random pi. Get samples. And then we just also push this back into our samples vector. Um, here afterwards, we use exactly this to, be, uh, to plot the line plot, which is then using the data of the samples and the data of the current estimate and also the length to create then a GUI for us. So one thing that we still need to do is that we change these vectors to float because we don't want to present an integer number. We want to present uh, the real number that is happening um, and then we can compile and let it run. So we're gonna compile this program and it will take a while because there's also the squeeze stuff inside and then we can just run it. So we see we already have a graph and then we probably want to auto fit this to the number of samples and also auto fit this to the number of lines. And now we can see here how our pi estimation is fluctuating over time. And we see that the, it slowly and steadily with increasing number of samples goes here to a value that we would expect somewhere around 3.14. Um, so you see nicely that the more samples we throw at our circle, the more uh, accurate our estimation here gets. And with this, we have already estimated pi using just random numbers and also a nice GUI for that. So thanks for joining me today for this little programming exercise. I hope you learned something. If you did, then probably subscribe and otherwise turn on your machine, get the code from GitHub, play around with it. And as always, enjoy coding.